This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. The Ecclesiastical History of England by the Venerable Bede. Chapter 27. How Cuthbert, a man of God, was made bishop, and how he lived and taught whilst still in the monastic life. 685 A.D. In the same year in which King Egfred departed this life, he, as has been said, caused the holy and venerable Cuthbert to be ordained bishop of the church of Lindisfarne. He had for many years led a solitary life in great continence of body and mind, in a very small island called Farne, in the ocean about nine miles distant from that same church. From his earliest childhood he had always been inflamed with the desire of a religious life, and he adopted the name and habit of a monk when he was quite a young man. He first entered the monastery of Malros, which is on the bank of the river Tweed, and was then governed by the abbot Eata, a man of great gentleness and simplicity, who was afterward made bishop of the church of Hagustald or Lindisfarne, as has been said above. The provost of the monastery at that time was Boisil, a priest of great virtue and of a prophetic spirit, Cuthbert, humbly submitting himself to this man's direction, from him received both a knowledge of the scriptures and an example of good works. After he had departed to the Lord, Cuthbert became provost of that monastery where he instructed many in the rule of monastic life, both by the authority of a master and the example of his own behavior. Nor did he bestow his teaching and his example in the monastic life on his monastery alone, but labored far and wide to convert the people dwelling round about from the life of foolish custom to the love of heavenly joys. For many profaned the faith which they held by their wicked actions, and some also, in the time of a pestilence, neglecting the mysteries of the faith which they had received, had recourse to the false remedies of idolatry, as if they could have put a stop to the plague sent from God by incantations, amulets, or any other secrets of the devil's art. In order to correct the error of both sorts, he often went forth from the monastery, sometimes on horseback, but oftener on foot, and went to the neighboring townships, where he preached the way of truth to such as had gone astray, which Boisil also in his time had been wont to do. It was then the custom of the English people that when a clerk or priest came to a township, they all at his summons flocked together to hear the word, willingly heard what was said, and still more willingly practised those things that they could hear and understand. And such was Cuthbert's skill in speaking, so keen his desire to persuade men of what he taught, such a light shone in his angelic face, that no man present dared to conceal from him the secrets of his heart, but all openly revealed in confession what they had done, thinking doubtless that their guilt could in no wise be hidden from him, and having confessed their sins, they wiped them out by fruits worthy of repentance, as he bade them. He was wont chiefly to resort to those places, and preach in those villages which were situated afar off, amid steep and wild mountains, so that others dreaded to go thither, and whereof the poverty and barbarity rendered them inaccessible to other teachers. But he, devoting himself entirely to that pious labor, so industriously ministered to them with his wise teaching, that, when he went forth from the monastery, he would often stay a whole week, sometimes two or three, or even sometimes a full month, before he returned home, continuing among the hill folk to call that simple people, by his preaching and good works, to the things of heaven. This venerable servant of the Lord, having thus spent many years in the monastery of Malros, and there become conspicuous by great tokens of virtue, his most reverend abbot, Eata, removed him to the isle of Lindisfarne, that he might there also, by his authority as provost, and by the example of his own practice, instruct the brethren in the observance of regular discipline. For the same reverend father then governed that place also as abbot. From ancient times the bishop was wont to reside there with his clergy, and the abbot with his monks, who were likewise under the paternal care of the bishop, because Aidan, who was the first bishop of the place, being himself a monk, brought monks thither, and settled the monastic institution there, as the blessed father Augustine is known to have done before in Kent, 
when the Reverend Pope Gregory wrote to him, as has been said above, to this effect, but in that you, my brother, having been instructed in monastic rules, must not live apart from your clergy in the church of the English, which has been lately, by the will of God, converted to the faith, you must establish the manner of conversation of our fathers in the primitive church, among whom none said that aught of the things which they possessed was his own, but they had all things common. Chapter 28 How the same St. Cuthbert, living the life of an anchorite, by his prayers obtained a spring in a dry soil, and had a crop from seed sown by the labor of his hands out of season. 676 A.D. After this, Cuthbert, as he grew in goodness and intensity of devotion, attained also to a hermit's life of contemplation, in silence and solitude, as we have mentioned. But for as much as many years ago we wrote enough concerning his life and virtues, both in heroic verse and prose, it may suffice at present only to mention this, that when he was about to go to the island, he declared to the brothers, if by the grace of God it shall be granted to me that I may live in that place by the labor of my hands, I will willingly abide there, but if not, God willing, I will very soon return to you. The place was quite destitute of water, corn, and trees, and being infested by evil spirits was very ill-suited for human habitation, but it became in all respects habitable at the desire of the man of God, for at his coming the wicked spirits departed. When, after expelling the enemy, he had, with the help of the brethren, built himself a narrow dwelling, with a mound about it, and the necessary cells in it, to wit, an oratory and a common living room, he ordered the brothers to dig a pit in the floor of the room, although the ground was hard and stony, and no hopes appeared of any spring. When they had done this, relying upon the faith and prayers of the servant of God, the next day it was found to be full of water, and to this day affords abundance of its heavenly bounty to all that resort thither. He also desired that instruments for husbandry might be brought him, and some wheat, but having prepared the ground and sown the wheat at the proper season, no sign of a blade, not to speak of ears, had sprouted from it by the summer. Hereupon, when the brethren visited him according to custom, he ordered barley to be brought him, if haply it were either the nature of the soil, or the will of God, the giver of all things, that such grain rather should grow there. He sowed it in the same fields when it was brought him, after the proper time of sowing, and therefore without any likelihood of its bearing fruit. But a plentiful crop immediately sprang up, and afforded the man of God the means which he had desired of supporting himself by his own labor. When he had here served God in solitude many years, the mound which encompassed his dwelling being so high that he could see nothing from it but heaven, which he thirsted to enter, it happened that a great synod was assembled in the presence of King Egfrid near the river Alne, at a place called Ad Tuifirdi, which signifies at the two fords, in which Archbishop Theodore of blessed memory presided, and there Cuthbert was, with one mind and consent of all, chosen bishop of the church of Lindisfarne. They could not, however, draw him from his hermitage, though many messengers and letters were sent to him. At last the aforesaid king himself, with the most holy bishop Trumwine, and other religious and powerful men, sailed to the island, many also of the brothers from the isle of Lindisfarne itself, assembled together for the same purpose. They all knelt, and conjured him by the Lord with tears and entreaties, till they drew him also in tears from his beloved retreat, and forced him to go to the synod. When he arrived there, he was very reluctantly overcome by the unanimous resolution of all present, and compelled to take upon himself the duties of the episcopate, being chiefly prevailed upon by the words of Boisil, the servant of God, who, when he had prophetically foretold all things that were to befall him, had also predicted that he should be a bishop. Nevertheless, the consecration was not appointed immediately, but when the winter which was then at hand was over, it was carried out at Easter, in the city of York, and in the presence of the aforesaid King Egfrid, seven bishops coming together for his consecration, among whom Theodore of blessed memory was primate. He was first elected bishop of the church of Hagustald in the place of Tunbert, who had been deposed from the episcopate. 
but because he chose rather to be placed over the church of Lindisfarne, in which he had lived, it was thought fit that Eata should return to the see of the church of Hagustald, to which he had been first ordained, and that Cuthbert should take upon him the government of the church of Lindisfarne. Following the example of the blessed apostles, he adorned the episcopal dignity by his virtuous deeds, for he both protected the people committed to his charge by constant prayer, and roused them by wholesome admonitions to thoughts of heaven. He first showed in his own life what he taught others to do, a practice which greatly strengthens all teaching, for he was above all things inflamed with the fire of divine charity, of sober mind and patient, most diligently intent on devout prayers, and kindly to all that came to him for comfort. He thought it stood in the stead of prayer to offer the weak brethren the help of his exhortation, knowing that he who said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, said likewise, Thou shalt love thy neighbor. He was noted for penitential abstinence, and was always through the grace of compunction intent upon heavenly things. And when he offered up to God the sacrifice of the saving victim, he commended his prayer to the Lord, not with uplifted voice, but with tears drawn from the bottom of his heart. Chapter 29 How this bishop foretold that his own death was at hand to the anchorite Herbert. 687 A.D. Having spent two years in his bishopric, he returned to his island and hermitage, being warned of God that the day of his death, or rather of his entrance into that life which alone can be called life, was drawing near, as he at that time with his wonted candour signified to certain persons, though in words which were somewhat obscure, but which were nevertheless afterwards plainly understood, while to others he declared the same openly. There was a certain priest called Herbert, a man of holy life, who had long been united with the man of God, Cuthbert, in the bonds of spiritual friendship. This man, leading a solitary life in the island of that great lake from which the river Derwent flows at its beginning, was wont to visit him every year, and to receive from him the teaching of everlasting salvation. Hearing that Bishop Cuthbert was come to the city of Lucobalia, he went thither to him, according to his custom, seeking to be more and more inflamed in heavenly desires through his wholesome admonitions. Whilst they alternately entertained one another with draughts of the celestial life, the bishop, among other things, said, Brother Herbert, remember at this time to ask me and speak to me concerning all whereof you have need to ask and speak, for when we part we shall never again see one another with bodily eyesight in this world, for I know of a surety that the time of my departure is at hand, and that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle. Hearing these words, Herbert fell down at his feet with tears and lamentations, and said, I beseech you by the Lord not to forsake me, but to remember your most faithful companion, and entreat the mercy of God that, as we have served him together upon earth, so we may depart together to behold his grace in heaven. For you know that I have always endeavored to live according to the words of your lips, and likewise whatsoever faults I have committed, either through ignorance or frailty, I have instantly sought to amend, according to the judgment of your will. The bishop applied himself to prayer, and having presently had intimation in the spirit that he had obtained what he asked of the Lord, he said, Rise, brother, and do not weep, but rejoice greatly, because the mercy of heaven has granted what we desired. The event established the truth of this promise and prophecy, for after their parting they never again saw one another in the flesh, but their spirits quitting their bodies on one and the same day, to wit, the twentieth of March, were immediately united in fellowship in the blessed vision, and together translated to the heavenly kingdom by the ministry of angels. But Herbert was first wasted by a long-continued infirmity, through the dispensation of the Lord's mercy, as may be believed, to the end that, if he was in any wise inferior in merit to the blessed Cuthbert, that which was lacking might be supplied by the chastening pain of a long sickness, that thus being made equal in grace to his intercessor, as he departed out of the body at one and the same time with him, so he might be accounted worthy to be received into the like abode of eternal bliss. The Most Reverend Father died in the Isle of Farne, 
earnestly entreating the brothers that he might also be buried there, where he had served no small time under the Lord's banner. But at length, yielding to their entreaties, he consented to be carried back to the isle of Lindisfarne, and there be buried in the church. This being done, the venerable Bishop Wilfred held the episcopal see of that church one year, till such time as a bishop should be chosen to be ordained in the room of Cuthbert. Afterwards, Eadbert was ordained, a man renowned for his knowledge of the Holy Scriptures, as also for his observance of the heavenly precepts, and chiefly for almsgiving, so that, according to the law, he gave every year the tenth part not only of four-footed beasts, but also of all corn and fruit, as also of his garments, to the poor. Chapter 30 how his body was found altogether uncorrupted after it had been buried eleven years, and how his successor in the bishopric departed this world not long after. 698 A.D. In order to show forth the great glory of the life after death of the man of God, Cuthbert, whereas the loftiness of his life before his death had been revealed by the testimony of many miracles when he had been buried eleven years, Divine Providence put it into the minds of the brethren to take up his bones. They thought to find them dry, and all the rest of the body consumed and turned to dust, after the manner of the dead, and they desired to put them into a new coffin, and to lay them in the same place, but above the pavement, for the honor due to him. They made known their resolve to Bishop Eadbert, and he consented to it, and bade them to be mindful to do it on the anniversary of his burial. They did so, and, opening the grave, found all the body whole, as if he were still alive, and the joints of the limbs pliable, like one asleep rather than dead. Besides, all the vestments in which he was clothed were not only undefiled, but marvellous to behold, being fresh and bright as at the first. The brothers, seeing this, were struck with a great dread, and hastened to tell the bishop what they had found, he being then alone, in a place remote from the church, and encompassed on all sides by the shifting waves of the sea. There he always used to spend the time of Lent, and was wont to pass the forty days before the Nativity of our Lord, in great devotion with abstinence and prayer and tears. There also his venerable predecessor, Cuthbert, had for some time served as the soldier of the Lord in solitude, before he went to the island of Farne. They brought him also some part of the garments that had covered the holy body, which presence he thankfully accepted, and gladly heard of the miracles, and he kissed the garments even with great affection, as if they had still been upon his father's body, and said, Let new garments be put upon the body in place of these you have brought, and so lay it in the coffin which you have prepared, for I know of a surety that the place will not long remain empty, which has been hallowed with so great grace of heavenly miracles." And how happy is he to whom the Lord, the author and giver of all bliss, shall vouchsafe to grant the privilege of resting therein. When the bishop had made an end of saying this and more in like manner, with many tears and great compunction and with faltering tongue, the brothers did as he had commanded them, and when they had wrapped the body in new garments and laid it in a new coffin, they placed it above the pavement of the sanctuary. Soon after, Bishop Eadbert, beloved of God, fell grievously sick, and his fever daily increasing in severity, ere long, that is, on the 6th of May, he also departed to the Lord, and they laid his body in the grave of the blessed Father Cuthbert, placing over it the coffin with the uncorrupted remains of that father. The miracles of healing, sometimes wrought in that place, testify to the merits of them both. Of some of these we have before preserved the memory in the book of his life. But in this history we have thought fit to add some others which have lately come to our knowledge. Chapter 31 Of One That Was Cured of a Palsy at His Tomb There was in that same monastery a brother whose name was Badudegn, who had for no small time ministered to the guests of the house, and is still living, having the testimony of all the brothers and strangers resorting thither, of being a man of much piety and religion, and serving the office put upon him only for the sake of the heavenly reward. This man, having one day washed in the sea the coverings or blankets which he used in the guest chamber, was returning home, when on the way he was seized with a sudden infirmity, insomuch that he fell to the ground, and lay there a long while, 
and could scarce at last rise again. When he got up, he felt one half of his body, from the head to the foot, struck with palsy, and with great trouble made his way home by the help of a staff. The disease increased by degrees, and as night approached became still worse, so that when day returned he could scarcely rise or walk alone. Suffering from this trouble, he conceived the wise resolve to go to the church as best he could, and approach the tomb of the reverend Father Cuthbert, and there on his knees, humbly beseech the mercy of God that he might either be delivered from that disease if it were well for him, or if by the grace of God it was ordained for him to be chastened longer by this affliction, that he might bear the pain which was laid upon him with patience and a quiet mind. He did accordingly as he had determined, and, supporting his weak limbs with a staff, entered the church. There prostrating himself before the body of the man of God, he prayed with pious earnestness that, through his intercession, the Lord might be propitious to him. As he prayed, he seemed to fall into a deep sleep, and, as he was afterwards wont to relate, felt a large and broad hand touch his head, where the pain lay, and likewise pass over all that part of his body which had been benumbed by the disease, down to his feet. Gradually the pain departed, and health returned. Then he awoke, and rose up in perfect health, and, returning thanks to the Lord for his recovery, told the brothers what had been done for him, and, to the joy of them all, returned the more zealously, as if chastened by the trial of his affliction, to the service which he was wont before to perform with care. Moreover, the very garments which had been on Cuthbert's body, dedicated to God, either while he was alive or after his death, were not without the virtue of healing, as may be seen in the book of his life and miracles, by such as shall read it. Chapter 32 Of one who was lately cured of a disease in his eye at the relics of St. Cuthbert. Nor is that cure to be passed over in silence, which was performed by his relics three years ago, and was told me lately by the brother himself on whom it was wrought. It happened in the monastery which, being built near the river Decor, has taken its name from the same over which at that time the religious Suidbert presided as abbot. In that monastery was a youth whose eyelid was disfigured by an unsightly tumour, which, growing daily greater, threatened the loss of the eye. The physicians endeavoured to mitigate it by applying ointments, but in vain. Some said it ought to be cut off, others opposed this course for fear of greater danger. The brother, having long laboured under this malady, when no human means availed to save his eye, but rather it grew daily worse, on a sudden, through the grace of the mercy of God, it came to pass that he was cured by the relics of the Holy Father Cuthbert. For when the brethren found his body uncorrupted, after having been many years buried, they took some part of the hair to give as relics to friends who asked for them, or to show in testimony of the miracle. One of the priests of the monastery, named Thruidred, who is now abbot there, had a small part of these relics by him at that time. One day he went into the church and opened the box of relics to give some part of them to a friend who asked for it, and it happened that the youth who had the diseased eye was then in the church. The priest, having given his friend as much as he thought fit, gave the rest to the youth to put back into its place. But he, having received the hairs of the holy head, prompted by some salutary impulse, applied them to the diseased eyelid, and endeavoured for some time, by the application of them, to abate and mitigate the tumour. Having done this, he again laid the relics in the box, as he had been bidden, believing that his eye would soon be cured by the hairs of the man of God, which had touched it nor did his faith disappoint him. It was then, as he is wont to relate, about the second hour of the day, but while he was occupied with other thoughts and business of the day, on a sudden, about the sixth hour of the same, touching his eye, he found it and the eyelid as sound as if there never had been any disfigurement or tumour on it. End of section 23